Jordanians, all said, you know, you, you really have to do something. I'm actually reminded of something Colin Powell once said. He said, there's a sort of a theory in, in, uh, in international relations and war. You broke it, you fix it. And we really contributed to breaking the situation. And, and so I think we rightly felt some responsibility to, to fix it. So we started bombing. And, and what have we accomplished? You know, despite all the attention in the media, you know, bad news seems to sell newspapers more than good. We have made some progress. You know, the Islamic State is actually smaller today than it was 14 months ago. We pushed them back. Our assistance to the Kurds has really borne fruit in the north. Um, the, the Islamic State has had to uh, retreat from some of its territory. Uh, it has won major victories in Palmyra and Syria. We've all watched the incredibly um, depressing destruction of this unbelievable historic site, the, the killing of, of civilians and historians. They, they took Ramadi back in Iraq. So they, they're not done, don't get me wrong. The Islamic State isn't um, on the ropes by any means. But our action, the, the, the coalition we put together, by we I mean you know, under US leadership, is actually making slow progress. So bottom line, I think, is we are making slow progress. It's too slow. There's too many failures. Um, and meanwhile, we watch on a daily basis as you know, the, the Islamic State beheads people and, and you know, it's, it's social media presence is, is really, truly horrifying. So I, I also ask myself, what in the last 14 months or so has happened that surprises me? What didn't I expect? I think we, a lot of people fundamentally misunderstood what the Islamic State was and is. We were so used to studying terrorism through the lens of Al-Qaeda. You know, Al-Qaeda, this small, very secretive group, intent on attacking the West, attacking the United States. And the Islamic State came from the same basic ideology, this Salafi, jihadist, uh, global view that you, know, you have to throw the West out and then create an Islamic caliphate. But it approached the problem completely differently than Al-Qaeda. So those of us who expected the Islamic State to behave sort of like Al-Qaeda did, we're, we're pretty surprised. And this is good and bad. On the good side, we haven't had a significant, sophisticated, transcontinental Islamic State attack. You know, they've motivated people, do-it-yourself terrorists, guys who were motivated to go out and, and, and attack in the name of uh, the Islamic State, but very unlike Al-Qaeda. We haven't had you know, aircraft bombings or sophisticated, multi-pronged attacks. That's just not the Islamic State style. Plus, they're pretty busy at home fighting on, on multiple fronts in Syria and, and in Iraq. The other thing, you know, we as Americans tend to vote because we think we're in the middle of the universe and everything sort of orbits around us. So the amount of time we've spent focused on American volunteers who have gone to fight is, in my opinion, a little bit um, exaggerated. Uh, about 200 Americans, give or take, have tried to go. And this is significant. I don't want to downplay it. But if you think about it, that's less than 1% of the foreigners who have gone to fight in Syria and Iraq. And most of them have gone to fight Assad. Some of them have joined the Islamic State. But in, in a way, we're sort of lucky. If you look at Tunisia, a very small country with a small security service, they have more than 2,500. The Russians have 10 times as many volunteers fighting in Iraq as we do. The Belgians, per capita, are, are uh, in much worse shape than we are. And we have by far the, the most advanced um, surveillance security establishment to, to keep an eye on. So you know, we need to be careful. <coughs> Certainly, Americans going out to fight for a terrorist group and then the possibility of coming, uh, them coming back is something we need to focus on. But let, let's not um, hyperventilate. I think the Iraqi military, like, we had no illusions that this was some crack special forces group when we left in, in 2011. 
But I don't think anyone expected them to be as spectacularly bad as they were. And this, this is historic proportions of defeat. The Iraqis outnumber the Islamic State in some cases by 100 to 1, 200 to 1. And yet they threw the brand new weapons and they parked their Humvees and they hoofed out of Mosul. They ran away from, in some cases, a couple dozen guys. These are entire battalions of Iraqi troops. And I'm not exaggerating. They were so afraid of the, of the reputation of the Islamic State. And they had so little invested in Iraq that even the small chance of being killed in the defense of their own country was sufficient to, to, to make them leave. And this is a town, Mosul, of over a million people. They had tens of thousands of security personnel, and they just left. They left the civilians to fend for themselves. And the, the, the number of forces that took Mosul, a few hundred. So again, spectacularly poor performance by, by the Iraqi military. And I think we, we need to draw some lessons from that. So we're in the business of training militaries in a lot of countries. We're training the Afghans right now. We've trained a lot of countries. And we generally, you know, we want to think that we're doing a pretty good job. And the forces that we train, that we give weapons to, are going to do a pretty good job themselves. And, and I think we need to, to take a, another look at that. Um, I also think that we, I underestimated the appeal of the Islamic State message. I mean, 99.9% .9 of humanity thinks that the Islamic State is the most reprehensible thing we've ever seen. And, and that's fine with the Islamic State. In fact, that's their goal. They want to be the baddest guys on the block. They want Al-Qaeda to blush when they think about how bad the Islamic State is. And they've accomplished that. The result is they're recruiting from a very small slice of humanity. They don't want just anyone. They want people who are willing to die and who buy into their very basic ideology. And it's taken root. I mean, it's taken root. The, the terrorist group in Nigeria, Boko Haram, has changed its name to uh, Islamic State in, uh, in Western Africa. The groups in Yemen and Libya, there's a group in the Sinai that calls itself a, a, a province of, of the Islamic State. So um, I'll, I'll reveal a little bit of optimism at the end of my talk about the prognosis for the Islamic State, but this is something we're going to deal with for years. These groups in Afghanistan and Libya, they're going to be around for a very long time. And that's going to be the long-term uh, legacy of, of the Islamic State. So what is the, is the appeal of this thing? I mean, if it's that reprehensible, and they kill so many people, what is it that volunteers? You still, today, there are probably people in London and in Brussels, and certainly in Cairo, who are trying to figure out how they can get to Raqqa to join the Islamic State. Mostly men, but women as well, increasingly. And this is unusual in this business, where the Islamic State is attracting women to come and marry the fighters and uh, bear a new generation of Islamic State um, citizens. What is it? And it was very hard for a Westerner to understand. But I think it's basically the simplicity of the message. You're either on our side, or we're going to kill you. And that's essentially their message. There's no pragmatism, there's no balance. The Islamic State is, is essentially brutal. And, and if, you're, if you look at the people who have joined them, they come from a bunch of different economic profiles, some are poor, some are rich, some are educated, some are not educated, some are converts, some are long, long time practicing Muslims, one thing most of them have in common is they feel distanced from their community. They don't have anything to belong to, and, they, and the Islamic State sort of lures them in. Belong to something bigger than you are. Protect the Sunni global community. 
And for a very few, but significant, 20,000, 30,000 Muslims worldwide, that has been sort of a, a, a call that they, they find appealing. So where do we go from here? How do we defeat ISIS? And, and I, I will say that um, I'm quite sympathetic to the cautious approach that the administration has taken. I think James's presentation on how confusing this region is and who's allied with whom and who's fighting on whose behalf and who's, it is really a mess. So before we jump in head first and we start giving weapons to groups whose loyalties and affiliation we don't really understand, we ought to be pretty cautious. But when the president said, when we launched into the airstrikes, that our goal is to defeat the Islamic State, I thought to myself, you're setting the bar a bit high. <laughs> we don't defeat ideologies. We haven't defeated communism or any of the isms. We've contained them, we've dismantled them, we've uh, made them less threatening, we've certainly shrunk them, but so, I think we need to set the bar at a level that we can achieve, and that is we reduce the threat, we contain the group, we shrink their, their territory. And I think my simplistic, and I don't have a monopoly on wisdom, and it's a very complicated thing, and sometimes I'm glad to be out of government, because I can just say things like, here's what we should do. And you know, nobody needs to listen to me. When I was in government, obviously I couldn't go to the White House, and, and sit in a meeting and say, you know what, Hillary, this is what you need to do as Secretary of State. Um, so here's my really simple plan. First, we have to remove the leadership. These guys are really smart. Omar al-Baghdadi and his ministers are really, they're great planners, they do social media like no terrorist organization has ever done before. They're, they're really um, effective, they're brutal, but you know, they've created a governance structure that some people in Western Syria have never had before. They provide bread, they provide schooling and clinics, and this is in a matter of a few months. So they're really smart. They're evil, but they're, they're smart. And I, I think one of the first steps, one of the most important steps to eventually um, succeeding against the group is to remove the leadership. The second thing is that we need to interrupt their finance. So we've done this for a long time. There have been aggressive attempts to, to, to limit the amount of money that goes to terrorists, but with some success. I mean, we, when, right after 9-11, one of the first things we did was um, go to the Gulf, go to the Qataris and the Kuwaitis and the Saudis, and we gave them proof their citizens we're sending money to Bin Laden. We said, this has to stop. You know, this guy just killed 3,500 of our people. He's a, a menace. You need to control the amount of money that's going into the terrorist coffers. And, and we made a lot of success. And, you know, it, it didn't solve the problem, but it shrank the problem, and that was sufficient. It's harder in the Islamic State case, because they most of their money is raised internally. Not very many people write checks and send it off to Baghdadi, but he has lots of internal resources. They have oil that they sell, they loot banks, they conduct smuggling and crime. And, um, and, and I think one of our first set of targets in Syria were the oil fields to prevent the, um, the Islamic State from actually selling oil. We, were, we, we did a good job, but not a perfect job. We've got to uh, reinforce that, that part of it. The third thing is we need to prevent recruits from coming into, into Syria. The Pentagon, I think, last week said that between 15 and 20,000 Islamic State fighters have been killed in the last 14 months. That's an enormous, that's an unbelievable ratio of their initial force. I mean, it's very few less committed forces could withstand that sort of casualty lines. But they do, and they do because they forcefully, forcefully recruit locally and they get volunteers from overseas. And most of them come through Turkey, and we need to sit on the Turks and make sure that 
they do a better job of policing their border. That border has been used for smuggling for a thousand years. It's never going to be perfect, but they can do a better job. The third thing is, and this is the hardest, and probably the most important, the Islamic State, its essential credo is continuing expansion. In order to be successful, the Islamic State has said, it has set itself up to be a, a huge caliphate from Morocco all the way to Iraq. And if they don't keep expanding, they fail. So we need to A, prevent them from expanding, and B, start rolling back their territory. And we've, we've started doing that. The problem, the challenge, is that you can't do that from the air. You need a ground force. And we've done a good job with the Kurds, and the Kurds have, in fact, the, I think the, the red is where the Kurds have actually started making some progress. It's either the red or the yellow. Um, and they have really taken back some territory, some really important ter territory, and provided a buffer for themselves, and also prevented um, the Islamic State from accessing the Turkish border in, in, in most part. But that's not enough. You, I mean, the Shia army in Iraq, are training them again, they're actually pretty good at defending their own communities. As long as Shia communities are threatened, the Shia militias and the Shia army do okay. They're not going to go into Sunni areas, and that's probably an okay thing. When the Shia go into Sunni areas, they often cause more problems than they solve. We need the Sunnis involved. We need the Sunnis in Iraq and the Sunni elements of the of the um, of the Syrian opposition to to commit to do what they did in 2006 and 2007 and say, all right, so we made a mistake. We threw our lot in with the Islamic State. We really hate them. We hate you less, and we're going to change our loyalties again. Um, and the fifth thing we need, something we Americans are sort of short on in many cases, is patience. You know, when the president announced the airstrikes, he said it's going to take three years, four years. He said, for sure, this is going to take longer than he has left as president. And I, I think it took a week until the news media started saying, we're losing. <laughs> you know, it's, the, this isn't working. And the president kept saying, and others, Give it time. Is this going to take years? And I think three years was an underestimate. It's going to take at least five years before we make measurable progress to shrink this thing down. A couple of other points before I open for, for uh, questions. And I think um, a question on a lot of people's minds is what, what are, are the Russians up to? Are they just doing this to piss us off? Really? Are they getting even? at us for the sanctions, or can you make sense of what the Russians are doing? And I gotta tell you, what the Russians are doing makes perfect sense. It's in fact a lot more sensible from a Russian perspective. If the Russians are looking at us, and they're saying, what about the Americans doing? That's gonna be hard to explain. From the Russian perspective, they're defending their only real ally in the Arab world. They have been at, in Syria for years, they have Navy base, they have now an, an air base, they've poured money in to support Assad, they have a lot at stake here. And they've been supporting him rhetorically and financially for a long time. When a month ago or so it looked like Assad's forces were weakening and he was actually at risk of, it made per perfect sense to me that the Russians would go in and, and bolster him. I think the way they did it was incredibly clever. I mean, I, I think that you know, getting as much as they did into Syria as quickly as they did under the cover of transport, um, just the analyst in me sort of, you know, I said, yeah, you know, Russians are pretty clever. And I don't think we could have done that. Um, first, we would have had to debate it in the press, and then the Republicans would attack the Democrats and vice versa, and it would have been a mess. But the Republicans, I mean, the, the Russians, do not tell me when I made that. <laughs> um, so the Russians, and it's not at all surprising as well that the Russians are attacking the people we support. They're, are they doing that to annoy us? Probably a little bit. But they're also doing it because those are the people that are the most 
the media is right to go outside. Remember, they're not they're doing this for one principal reason, and that is to strengthen Assad. And strengthen Assad's regime. <coughs> Assad, the Bashar, eventually I think they're gonna, you know, they're not gonna need him. They need the regime, they need the people who they've supported for years and years to remain an important player in Syria, and that's what they're doing. Eventually, the Russians have at least as much, if not more, to fear from ISIS as we do. I mentioned 2,500 Chechens and Dagestanis and Tajiks and others, people on the southern border, in the southern republics of, of the Russian Republic, they're fighting. And they're, they're almost no fighters who are scarier than the Chechens. I remember when I worked as an intel officer at the agency, I was working on, on Al Qaeda, and I remember the Al Qaeda guys saying to each other, "These Chechens, they're nuts." <laughs> you know, I would not want to run into one of those guys in a dark alley. And these are terrorists talking to each other. So the Chechens are people to be feared, and the Russians are afraid that they're going to have an Islamic uh, uprising in the south. So I think eventually the Russians are going to come around and um, realize that we do have common cause against the Islamic State. Um, so, last word, for a little bit of a prognosis, where does this go from here? You know, what's, what is, how do I think this is going to turn out? What are the prospects? And I think, first of all, in ISIS. I mentioned I'm a little bit of an optimist. Um, I may be in the minority. I think ISIS can't win. And I think it's up to us to make sure that they lose. But their strategy is not a winning strategy. You know, they've got too few people, too little money, they've made too many enemies. You think about how many people they're fighting right now. They're fighting the Syrian Kurds, the Iraqi Kurds, the Iraqi army, the Syrian army, the United States, now the Russians and Hezbollah and Iran, and they've got internal fights. They kill their own soldiers for doing for, for, you know, being un-Islamic. I mean, these guys have no pragmatism. So I, I do not think they're playing a winning hand. I think it's a matter of how long it takes for the anti-ISIS coalition to actually succeed. But I, I think it's also important to remember that beating ISIS or, or defeating ISIS or even significantly containing them, it, it's important. But ISIS is a big problem in the region. It's not the only problem. It may not even be the worst, the biggest problem. So ISIS is gone. The future of Syria is still sort of very questionable. And even in Iraq, and I, I'm a little bit more optimistic about Iraq. I think with decent governance, if you get a prime minister who actually tries to, to link together the three main communities, the Kurds, the Shia, and the Sunnis, there is a reasonable chance that Iraq will again um, be Iraq. And you can recognize it as a country. It, not guaranteed. Um, I'm not sure I, I buy a bunch of Iraqi futures. But I can, I can sort of chart a path that ends up with Iraq as an OK country. Harder to say about Syria. Syria is, I would say, almost beyond repair. There are so many people who have been killed quarter of a million people. A third of the country has been displaced. So I think um, Dahlia can either talk about that or we can take questions about it. And you've got so many people who've got <coughs> blood feuds and tribal feuds and village against village. It's hard for me to imagine how we fix Syria. The only possible conclusion is that you go village by village as they exhaust themselves and they they run out of fighters, they run out of weapons, that we start establishing ceasefires locally, and that it, it's going to require an international consensus between the Russians, the Iranians, and us to start you know, clamping down on it. But we're years away from that. They've been fighting for four years, and I think they've got a good, long period of fighting um, ahead of them. So with that cheery note, um, Don, did you want to talk about it? Or just over the question? No, thank you. Uh, thank you.
both. That was absolutely fascinating. We're going to take some questions. Uh, we're getting a bit on for time, so what we'll do is a version of what we always do. We'll have the Garfield Scholars come up first, uh, but we won't necessarily do as many as we usually do, and we can have them, uh, the rest of them do their questions after dinner tonight. So uh, maybe if two Garfield Scholars want to go to each mic, and uh, we'll take you one after the next, and then after that we'll open it up to the general audience. ISIS, that's easy. Um, oh. uh, I, I, that's, my <laughs> that's actually what the Israelis think about ISIS. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it, obviously, uh, ISIS is a fundamental threat to Israel. I mean, it is, when it, when it says it's want, it wants to create a caliphate from Morocco to Iraq, Israel is, is somewhere in there. I mean, Jews are among the many apostates and infidels that the Islamic State and the Salafi jihadists target. Um, but you know, it's not at this point an existential threat to the state of Israel. I mean, they are really busy fighting all of those uh, other foes that I was describing. And as far as I know, the Islamic State. Has, it hasn't really focused a whole lot on Israel. What they have done, and, and the fighting in the Arab world has gutted the conventional military threat that has faced Israel since its existence. So you don't have a Syrian army. The Syrian army is pretty much gone. You don't have an Iraqi army, which I described. Most of the Arab world is now focused on the Sunni threat. So in a way, the Israelis must be watching this with some sort of satisfaction. But on Iran. Well, yeah, well, and just to add to that, I mean, I, I think um, there are concerns, though, about ISIS infiltrating Gaza. And one of the lessons that should come, I think, come out of, of all our presentations is that ungoverned areas, security vacuums, are a recipe for disasters. Bad actors tend to capitalize on those security vac vacuums. And that usually works against U.S. interests and interests of our allies. So I think the Israelis and Israeli security and military folks I talked to were quite concerned about that. And I was, you know, segue to Iran and it, it, my overview, and it was quick. But you know, essentially, my point there was is there are some divisions within Israel. The general um, view does mirror the Prime Minister's public yeah. um, uh, hostility toward the deal and toward Iran, and view that this is. Uh, nice words coming from Rouhani, or what he calls, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing, and so forth. So the, the generally uh, Israeli view of Iran is still this is a significant threat, but there are divisions, and, and mostly, again, partly because of the nuclear, of course, Israel doesn't want another nuclear state in the Middle East, but more because of the cover the nuclear capability would have given if they had acquired it, and it's still a worry. Um, when you have a nuclear capability, then you have less ability, there's less freedom of action by other actors in the region, including the Israelis, to confront that state. You're less likely to go to war against a state with nuclear capabilities because you worry about escalation. So the Israelis were opposed to that, but as I was suggesting, they're most concerned about Iranian missile activity, terrorism, um, and you know other kinds of destabilizing activities in, in, in the region. But I do think it is important to look at some of those fissures. There are different threat assessments in Israel about how high priority the Iranian threat is compared to all of these other centers of instability um, really right on Israel's back door. And Iran is connected. That gets the interconnectedness. Iran's connected to Hezbollah. That's the biggest one. But Hamas, the Sunni group Hamas, which is one of Israel's other um, very worrisome enemies, 
actually cut off ties with the Iranians because of Syria. They are very upset with Iran for supporting Assad, and they're supporting the Sunni rebel forces. So even there, you know, um, and then now you've seen in Israel, I think we should point out the current instability in Israel right now. Which has nothing um, to do with the Islamic nothing State. Nothing to do with Islamic State and nothing to do with Iran because we've got the festering Palestinian-Israeli conflict which goes on and on and on. And, um, and there are some Israelis who are saying this is a wake-up call. You know, all of us talk about Iran for 20 years. Phoebe's talking about it's two months from a bomb. It's two months from Iran. We're 20, you know, 15 years later, there's a nuclear deal. Not to say Iran isn't a problem, but, you know, we literally have problems right inside our country. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Uh, thank you both very much for coming up. My question deals with U.S. military strategy in the region. And it has been shown that the U.S. is not that great at counterinsurgency operations. Um, and it's not very adept at, uh, at using guerrilla warfare style that we're seeing in the Middle East. Um, several years ago, General Petraeus put forth his method of how the U.S. should adapt its uh, fighting styles, which has been tried several times and has been unsuccessful. Um, he said that we should focus on protecting civilians over killing the enemy and using maximum, not minimum, or sorry, using minimum, not maximum force. Um, so is this a viable strategy for modern warfare, um, especially the U.S. warfare in that region? And if not, how can our military adapt to be more effective in this new style of fighting and in the terrain we see ourselves almost constantly engaged in? Yeah, I mean, I think the key word that you used is adapt. And I think one of the problems was that uh, we were unprepared for the type of warfare that we experienced in Iraq. Um, so the insurgency just kept getting bigger and bigger 